Well, welcome to the Daily Brief on Metro Milwaukee's health and the economy, brought to you by the Medical College of Wisconsin and the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce. I'm Tim Sheehy, president of the MMAC, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. John Raymond, president of the Medical College. Each day at 3.30, we bring you a 19-minute fact-filled update on the impact of COVID-19 on our health and the economy. This webcast is powered by Aurora WDC. And our special guest today is Charles Franklin, Marquette Law School poll director, uh, and we'll be getting some interesting insights on how the public is feeling about COVID-19. But before we get to that, let's start with an update uh, from Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. This first slide summarizes the various indicators of COVID-19 as of today, and I'll run through these quickly. Doubling times for COVID-19 were stable at 15.8 days in Wisconsin and 19.9 days in Milwaukee. Daily growth rates over the last seven days also are stable at 2.9% in Wisconsin and 2.8% in Milwaukee. There were 291 positive tests today in Wisconsin out of over 4,000 tests administered for a positive rate of 6.3%. There were 47 new, sorry, there were almost 150 new tests in, Wisconsin, in Milwaukee today, and we have a pending on the uh, number of percentage tests. Testing capacity stable at 13,800. And in Wisconsin, we had 343 inpatient admissions for COVID-19 with 122 in the intensive care units out of 362 available ICU beds. ICU and ventilator capacity were adequate in Wisconsin and stable. And PPE trends also were stable in Wisconsin and Milwaukee with the most critical current shortage of hospital gowns. Next uh, slide, please. Our Wednesday What to Watch for May 13, 2020 is antigen testing for COVID-19. Antigen tests for COVID-19 are new to the market, but have been widely used for influenza and other viruses because the technology is simple and inexpensive. Quidel received emergency use authorization this past Saturday for their first to market COVID-19 antigen test. And it's important to note that Quidel is a reputable company with broad experience and a good track record for this type of testing. Now, like the RT-PCR method, the antigen test assesses assesses whether an individual has a current infection or had a recent infection from COVID-19. But rather than measuring COVID-19 RNA, this antigen test detects a COVID-19 protein, specifically the nucleocapsid protein, as shown on the bottom right side of this slide. Now, this test has been reasonably well validated. A positive test is highly specific, and it's on par with the RT-PCR test and could be considered diagnostic. A negative test requires confirmation because of a high false negative rate of about 20%. And the main advantage of this test is that it's inexpensive and easy to manufacture. Next slide, please. And just a reference to go back to some of our previous conversations, this slide now lists the three types of COVID-19 tests on the market. The first type of test measures COVID-19 RNA, which detects an active infection and the most commonly used methods are the polymerase chain reaction to amplify and detect COVID-19 RNA through a series of heat cool cycles. And this PCR test is considered to be the gold standard. Now Abbott developed another type of RNA test that does not require the heating cooling cycles and can be performed quickly on a single sample in about 15 minutes. And this is the type of test that's used in the White House. Now, the second type of test is the antigen test, which I just described from Quidel. And I expect that many other manufacturers will bring similar products to the market soon. And the third type of test, which we've discussed before, measures antibodies against COVID-19, and that's a serological test. Next slide, please. This slide shows the three types of COVID-19 tests in a pictorial form. The two tests, types of tests on the left to side of the slide are diagnostic tests for COVID-19, and those measure either RNA or protein from the virus. The types of tests on the right measure IgG and or IgM antibodies produced by an infected patient as part of their immune response. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows the time frame of the various tests, and we've, we've discussed this before. Starting from the left, diagnostic tests measure either RNA or protein from the COVID-19 virus. And those are positive in the first seven days after symptoms develop. As the COVID-19 infection clears, antibodies begin to be detectable, first IgM and then IgG. And we still don't know whether those antibodies give immunity to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Now this next slide is for your future reference. It compares characteristics of various FDA approved COVID-19 tests that are currently on the market. I encourage you to download this from the chat panel or the handout panel if you're interested in having this for reference. I do want to call your attention to the second line, which describes a saliva test for COVID-19 RNA recently developed by Rutgers University that was granted emergency use authorization this past Saturday. Now, the potential advantages of the saliva test are that they do not require a swab and can be self-administered and can be mailed into a reference laboratory. So this is a promising development that we should follow and we may talk about in the future. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Uh, and I like the fact that we're moving to and talking about tests uh, and the tracking and tracing, and hopefully at some point a vaccine. So all pointing forward. Um, I'm gonna bring Charles Franklin in here now, who's just, uh, recently completed a poll on behalf of uh, Marquette's Law School um, and some trends that are shaping up uh, as uh, we start to not lose our focus on COVID, but increase our focus on the economic impact. So Charles, uh, give us some good top lines from the poll. Okay, thank you, glad to be here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about where, how people feel about reopening and about the virus and the steps that have been taken to combat it. I'm gonna stay away from the politics right now. We can come back to that a little bit later if you wish. Um, the first is the question of whether the shutdowns of businesses and schools and the safer at home is an appropriate reaction or whether it's an overreaction that's doing more harm than good. In March, late March, when we asked this question the first time, it was near unanimity. 86% said it was an appropriate reaction. Just 10% said it was an overreaction. And there was very little partisan difference in that response. This month, there's still a strong majority in favor of the shutdowns. 69% say it's an appropriate reaction. But now we're up to 26% that say it's an overreaction. So that 26% is definitely a minority, but it's not a trivially small minority. And it's become more partisan, whereas over 75% of Republicans thought it was appropriate a month ago. Republicans are now divided about 45-45 on this question, while Democrats are over 90% saying it's appropriate. So there you see a shift in opinion. There's still a strong majority, but unlike March, this is now more of a partisan issue than it was then, and probably will become more partisan as we go ahead. This time we asked a question about whether you thought it was a bigger risk that we open the state too fast or that we open it too slowly. 56% said the risk was bigger for opening too quickly. 40% said the bigger risk was opening too slow. So that 40% is a good deal bigger than the 26% we just talked about. It's still a minority, but it's a quite substantial minority that are more concerned about the pace of reopening uh, too slowly. So that's where you're gonna see further pressure come. People's circumstances are very much affected. This month, we're seeing 15% who say they themselves have lost a job, but 38% more, in addition to that, say someone else in their household has lost the job. Household or family, I should say. Mm -hmm. So some people may answer this thinking about their kids that aren't in the household, but that's a big number. In terms of work hours being cut, 24% say that's happened to them, 43% say it's happened to someone in their family. Overall, over 50% have had one of these things happen 
to either themselves or someone in their family. So it's only about half that say they haven't been affected in either of these two ways. Uh, it's about half that say someone in the family or themselves have had this. Um, interestingly, we don't see a big surge in the percentage of people saying they're financially struggling. We've been asking for a long time, are you living comfortably just getting by or struggling? The struggling is maybe the more important indicator. It's only inched up a little bit in the whole population, up only about two or three points. Um, just getting by is up a point or two, but it's not dramatic. But when we look at the most affected community in the state, African-Americans, we see that the economic impact has been at least double what it is for whites in the state. And the percentage struggling has gone from about 9% up to about 25%. So a big growth there. And that economic impact follows along with the greater health impact in terms of disease burden and death that's occurred in the, in the black community. Um, I wanted to just close with a mention about regional differences because it'd be natural to think that there are big regional differences. Obviously, uh, the Southeast has been pretty heavily hit recently. The Fox Valley has been heavily hit. But the west and the north of the state, for the most part, have avoided big outbreaks, at least so far. So I'm going to read you a few numbers. I promise just a few, but I want you to get a sense of these numbers. Overall, 69% uh, said that closing down the state was an appropriate reaction. In the principal cities around the state, so this is not just Milwaukee, this is Green Bay and Wausau and Eau Claire as well. 71% say it's appropriate. In the suburbs close in around those cities, 67% say it's appropriate. In the exurbs further away, 71%. In the small towns, 71%. And in the isolated rural areas, 68%. So I think you might believe from some of the rhetoric that there are vast differences in how people are responding depending on where they live and what type of community it is. I hope those numbers convinced you that it's actually pretty slight. I do wanna mention it by media market as well. In the city of Milwaukee, 81% say it's appropriate. That's where we had a big impact. You also see that reaction, but it's still 71% in the wow counties. It's 64% in the rest of the Milwaukee region 74 in Madison, 62 in Green Bay, 74 in La Crosse, Eau Claire. So again, you don't see big regional variation. What if we opened tomorrow? Would we see the economy spring back? And the answer here is a very mixed one. 77% of people say they would be comfortable going to a friend or relative's house for the evening. 56% would be comfortable going to a shopping mall or a big box store. Then it drops into the 40s for going to a worship service, 42% for going to eat in a restaurant, and all the way down to 25% willing to go to a baseball or football game. And so I think you see a big range here. If we open the doors tomorrow, I think at best we'd be looking at a 40% economy not a hundred percent economy and we don't know how people will actually behave i think the seventh congressional district special election yesterday is a good indicator their absentees amounted to 48 percent of the ballots cast in that election yesterday in a heavily rural non-urban district that's less than the 56 percent that voted absentee in april but I think you get a measure from that that's not just what people will tell a pollster on the phone, but how they're voting by their with their feet or in this case with their mail-in ballots. So I'm going to stop there and uh, Tim, let you take any, give me any questions you want to follow up on. Sure. I, I do have a follow-up question is long as you've been polling and I've been following your polls and other polls, rarely do other issues trump economic concerns. Yeah. Uh, and this one is fascinating. Uh, because with all the clamor to swing the gate open, open the economy, um, your polling indicates while there's movement, um, it just doesn't seem to trump uh, the, or the COVID seems to trump the economic interests. I, I think at the moment it does. 
I've been saying from the beginning of this, back in March, I warned that the economic impact can only grow over time. It will grow for people that get a paycheck and now aren't getting them. It will certainly grow from businesses, especially small businesses with no capital cushion that they can draw on. So I think this is only going to grow over time. The issue will be if we reopen, you've placed a bet that we can do that and not have a surge of outbreak. You know that we've been below the outbreaks in Minnesota and Illinois and Michigan. We don't want to have their experience, but we don't know. We have theories, we have models and all of that, but we don't know. And so it's a big bet that we open now, that we don't see a surge of cases and people do become comfortable going back into their routines. But if that bet is wrong and we see a surge of cases, then we at the very least have to have policies in mind for how do we ramp that back? How do we stamp down uh, outbreaks? Maybe we're lucky and we just have localized outbreaks that we can control locally, but that's not my area. That we'll leave for the public health experts. Sure. And let's bring Dr. Raymond back in and uh, Chris, uh, go to questions for Charles and, and Dr. Raymond. Yeah, first for Charles, uh, maybe since this may not be your typical poll crowd, can you explain how you do polling both versus cell phones and landlines, which I know way too much about now? And yeah, also, I know, Chris, we've tried to teach you about that over the years. <laughs> but um, yeah, just go through that real quick. Yes, ours is a telephone poll. We dial numbers randomly throughout the state. So every number has an equal chance to be dialed. We do about two thirds of the interviews by cell phone, about one third by landline and uh, all of it is done with live interviews, uh, live interviewers, not a robocall or something like that. Uh, the one positive side about the shutdown is our response rate has gone up by a factor of four. Right. Uh, people at home are much more willing to talk to us now than they were before. We'll talk to anybody, even you, right? Even me, yes. <laughs> So this may not be something that was in this poll, but I know it's something you've tracked in the past. How much does your media consumption diet affect your view on these or other issues? Yeah, that's something that we are following, but a lot of your media consumption is driven by your partisan leaning these days. So um, we see about a quarter of people say they primarily rely on Fox News for their national news, but about a third rely on one of the big three TV networks. And less than that, about 15 or so percent rely on CNN or MSNBC and a small percentage of uh, public television or public broadcasting. Um, when you look, there are big differences in how people respond depending on what news source they have. But once you take into account their partisanship, the news source is a much smaller effect. So it's difficult to say that a Democrat who watches Fox will have different views than a Democrat who watches CNN or Republicans that watch either of those two things. It's much more that Democrats want to tune in to CNN and Republicans are much more likely to tune in to Fox. I will say two, two things, if I can just squeeze this in. The big change that we saw is people are now much more optimistic about opening the state by August. Uh, it was over 71% that thought we could do that in March, but now it's uh, down to about 38% that think we can reopen by March. It's at least 51% that think it'll be the fall or even later. So people are getting, at the same time, a desire to reopen, also more concerned about when we can reopen and get back to normal. Dr. Raymond, we had a question for you about whether you're aware of a delay in deploying the Roche antibody testing in Wisconsin, and if so, do you know when that might be online? I think I heard the question was whether there's a delay in the deployment of the Roche antibody testing. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure of any other place other than the Wisconsin Diagnostic Lab, which is a freighter and an MCW lab. Um, they're ready for the um, antibody test to be rolled out pretty soon. Sounds great. We uh, also, Dr. Raymond, we had a question about whether staying at home can inadvertently do damage to your immune system, presumably by not being exposed to as, as many things as you would be if you were out and about. I guess in theory, for a newborn, maybe, but um, but 
the simple answer is no, that shouldn't be a concern for anybody. Gotcha. We also had a question as to whether you knew what test type there are they're administering at the new two new Milwaukee sites. I believe those are the standard RT-PCR test that measures RNA and the virus. So that would be the gold standard test. Um, those require a nasal and an oral swab. Finally, Charles, we had somebody ask what uh, caller ID identification comes up when you call so they can know to answer it. Yeah, we don't do that. Um, they just see the number from our call center, uh, which can be in different places depending on which call center we're using. It does not say poll, Marquette poll, opinion research or anything like that. And there's a subtle reason for that. We don't want to bias the sample by letting people know whether to pick up or not, depending on whether they like us or hate us. And so it's better to be blind and just see a number you don't recognize. Now, a lot of people don't pick up, that's for sure. But when you pick up, you're not doing it because you either like the Marquette poll or you hate the Marquette poll. Once you're on the line, we tell you who we are immediately. That we're calling on behalf of the Marquette poll. But at that point, you're on the line. And normally, about 55% complete interviews at that point. During the coronavirus, 80% have stayed on the line and talked to us. Excellent. Well, thank you to all three of you. And thanks, everybody who asked the questions today. Yeah, again, uh, thanks, Charles. Dr. Raymond, uh, fascinating discussion uh, on kind of public policy, perception of COVID, and then the healthcare realities that we're facing. So we'll uh, stay with this evolving story, uh, be back tomorrow with an update on the dashboard uh, and talking about restarting uh, primary care, uh, an important part about this, then we'll finish out the week uh, with Mayor Barrett and a look back on trends. Uh, and then as it were, just a small programming note, uh, next week um, in honor of our move forward in this crisis to recovery and the next normal, uh, we'll be broadcasting on uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at 3.30 in the afternoon. So again, Dr. Raymond, Charles, thank you very much. Have a safe, healthy rest of the day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye.